Aloha and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Got Your Six podcast. This six-question podcast brings together high performers to share their methods, strategies, and ideas delivered in an informative and, most importantly, actionable way that will help you lead yourself and those around you from the battlefield to the boardroom. Coming to you every episode, I'm your host, Tony Nash. And into the breach. Nothing mentioned on this podcast is an endorsement or opinion of the Department of Defense. I got your six, we got your back. Got your six, we got your back. Got your six, we got your back. I got your six. Sixers, what an absolute treat today. Our guest uh, is behind one of the most incredible veteran organizations that I've ever been a part of uh, in my life. And you know what they do. You might not know who they are, but absolutely what they represent. Joe Regan is the Director of Military and Veteran Outreach for Reese Across America. You see him all, every Veterans Day, every Memorial Day with a wreath that kind of come up. Um, it almost looks like it just kind of happens, but there's so much behind that and how we get there. Uh, and today, Joe is going to kind of dive back to his time uh, coming out of Norwich, you know, being part of 10th Mound, right, climbing to glory. Joe, thank you so much for being part of the show today. Well, thanks for having me, Tony. It's great to be here. And, uh, you know, I love your podcast and all that you're doing to support our military members, our veterans, and their families as well. It's, it's a great to be part of the, the show. And glad to count you as part of a six, you know, as you are now a sixer uh, going forward. And this <laughs> kicks off our partnership between the Gotcha Six podcast and Reeds Across America as we look to continue to spread outreach uh, between both, both of our organizations. That's right. And, you know, that's one of the most important parts about Reads Across America. You mentioned in the opening, you know, many people see what we do. They, they know what we do. They've heard the stories. But what we look at this as being is this is so much more than just a wreath. This is the start of a, of a journey. And when someone lays that wreath on the headstone of a veteran, and this is happening at over uh, 3,500 locations across the country. And last year we laid over 2.4 million wreaths um, at those locations. It's it's creating that uh, that bond between that person, that American, and that service member. And sometimes they know who the person is. Sometimes it's a family member or a relative or a friend. And sometimes it's a complete stranger. But it starts that process of making that connection between those two people and, and helping them become part of that service member's journey and their story. And it's podcasts like yours and what we're doing at Reads Across America through your podcast and so many others to help amplify those stories and get them out there into the population so folks can hear exactly that scope of sacrifice that's made on our behalf each and every day. No, ab- absolutely. And you touched on one thing that I want to kind of highlight is that bond, right? Whether you know someone or you don't, it's that shared understanding of knowing what someone had to go through, especially when they gave the ultimate sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you look back in your time in service, is there a bond or some like formula of experience that was really like you continue to implement daily uh, throughout your life? Oh, you know, I think there's, you know, it's funny. I, you can't see it on the camera because I keep the camera focused on all these external pieces, right? All the, all the, the all love the me wall stuff, stuff. Yeah. But it's what's in front of me. I think that means it's what I'm looking at. That means more to me. And, and one of the little trinkets that I have in front of me is, is actually the, um, the, the Ranger's Creed from my Ranger handbook. And I think that's some, oh, see, you've got it too. You're going to pull it out. Got it right here. Don't and, no, every time. Yeah. So I, Absolutely. I framed mine from yeah. the actual from my actual Ranger handbook, and I, I look at that all the time because I think that, you know, when you're going through these processes, when you're going through these trainings, you know, we've got creeds and we've got songs, we've got all these things. At the time, it's really just I have to say this thing so that I can go eat, and that's what's important to me at the time. But now looking back at it, having served on active duty and having continued to serve our veteran community in the nonprofit world. You know, those words suddenly take on a whole lot more meaning that you didn't realize they might have had at the time. And you experienced it, so you were experiencing the meaning, but you never really put the two together. And now, as you, as I look back at it, I look at those types of things, I say, you know, wow, that really does have a lot of meaning. You know, those, those stanzas like, you know, my country expects more of me, that's something that never goes away. That is something that drives you in everything that you do. And as I hear so many other stories from veterans, some of whom I've served with, some of whom um, I haven't served, I didn't serve with, and multiple generations of veterans, by the way, going back World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the story is always the same. You know, that we've seen so much sacrifice that went into securing 
all the things that we hold dear, we really do, it becomes a personal piece of us to make sure that we live up to the legacy of, of all the men and women that we served alongside, especially those that made the ultimate sacrifice. No, absolutely. And the sacrifice piece sometimes, um, to someone who's never served in the military is almost like a bridge too far, right? They can't, they, like, I can't, I, I hear it all the time. I'm sure you do too. Like people mm -hmm. are like, I, I'm appreciative, but I just can't understand. How do you work with wreaths across America and you and the team kind of to help more or less bridge that gap, right? To, because I don't think people need to like have to go through it to understand it or mm -hmm. have to go into battle, but it's more of just the, the understanding and the, the gravity of all of that. Yeah. How do you guys look to, you know, kind of really, like I said, bridge that gap? Well, I think, I think as an organization, I'll, I'll give you two answers to that question. As, as yeah. an organization, uh, we do that by sharing the stories and experiences of veterans. Um, and we do that in a number of different ways. We've got, um, like I said, through our radio station, through just the, the experience of going and, and just connecting with a veteran or maybe hearing the story of a Gold Star family as you're uh, at a wreath laying event. Uh, but, but personally, you know, one of the things I say a lot of times is if you, if, you pull a, if you pull a stranger off the street and say, describe for me a veteran, the chances are they're going to give you one of two descriptions. They're going to describe to you something that looks like Captain America, or they're going to give you something that looks a whole lot like Lieutenant Dan on a bad day, not when he gets his, his magic legs. Right. Um, and the reality of that situa of the, of the situation is that neither one of those extremes represents the majority of veterans. And so what I try and do is, is, especially for young people, try to to personalize the experience. And I know for me, one of the things that, um, you know, last year on our escort to Arlington, uh, I spoke at one of our events, I think it was day two or three. And so I'd been on this convoy now for um, two or three days. I've gotten to know many of the people that were on it. And I got up and I shared the story of uh, uh, an experience I had during a convoy in Afghanistan back in 2006. And... Um, the gunner in the truck that was about uh, two trucks in front of me was killed during the the convoy uh, and it was a it was a really nasty firefight and quite frankly we're uh fortunate that kevin edgen was the only one to make the ultimate sacrifice that night because it was a, a pretty bad event and afterwards several people came up to me and said they're like wow i would have never thought that you someone like you had experienced it like we kind of assumed that you had served, but we thought maybe you were like some desk jockey or someone in the Air Force or something like that. No offense to the Air Force people. Um, and I said, well, but what would you have thought about me if that was the first story you ever heard about me? And they said, well, that's it's interesting. I guess I would have thought a lot differently about you. And I said, you know, that's, that's part of the problem is when we think about service, we think of, and, you know, we, we use the word in term heroes and stuff like that. And in reality, oftentimes heroics happen when regular people like you and I are put into a situation. And, and another story I like to tell is um, um, Sammy Davis, who was a Medal of Honor recipient from uh, from Vietnam. He and I were, were speaking in an event one night. And afterwards, he and I were sitting down and talking about it. And he, he said, you know, you never asked me the question that everyone asked me. And I said, what's that? And he said, you know, he said, everyone always asks why I did it. And if you're not familiar with Sammy Davis, please do. I don't want to. I know we've got some limited time on our podcast here, but you know, take a moment to, yeah, to research go, it. Just, I, yeah. The, just the long, audience. the long story, the, the the very short story here, is the scene in Forrest Gump where Forrest Gump is running back and forth to collect his friends during that attack. That was what essentially Sammy Davis did. And uh, he goes, you know, people always ask me how could I do it, and my response is, well, how could you not? These are your friends. These are people that you know. And so it's not a question of, do I do this or not? It's a question of, my friend needs me. Of course I'm going to go get them. Of course I'm going to do this. And I think that having met several Medal of Honor recipients, of course, serving in the military with many, many people that have been highly decorated, uh, you know, that is exactly what rings true. And so I think that when we break it down in that sense, and for, for kids, and I use it for my own children, I said, you know, we're talking about bullying, right? If your friend's being bullied, aren't you going to stick up for him? And I said, of course. I said, it's really the same. It's really the same thing. And I think that when we we change the narrative into that sense and say, no, this, these are things that we all know is the right thing to do. And and when we're pushed pushed in that situation, almost always, you know, people are going to make that right choice. And um, 
and I think that's something that that you know whether you you've served, you've probably experienced that. And if you if you've never served, you know, read books about these experiences and listen to how these people talk about what they've done. And that that is a message I think that each and every one of us can take into our daily lives. No, absolutely not. I'm sure everyone can kind of think to an experience where they've kind of looked, they look back and they're like, I can't believe I did that. Like that, that would be like, that's kind of out of character for me to go and go out of my way to help or serve or do something for someone else. But it's not like a test, right? You're not Mm -hmm. studying, waiting to like make sure you circle or like fill in the right letter to on the, as you go through like the different like questions, you just kind of, you're there, you're, you're Mm -hmm. doing it and everything else just kind of like goes away. And you just focus in on that specific action. Yep. Yeah, and and I think that in talking to a lot of veterans, especially combat veterans, one of the things that comes out is people will talk about how you know how easy deployments were in a sense. And that sounds weird to say, but in in a sense, when you think about it, when you're on a deployment, when you're in a combat zone, you have very few outside things to worry about. It and really is combat is all about the pre- uh, you're you're entirely engulfed in the present and past and future really have no meaning to anyone because it all goes away and you're you're entirely focused on on what's happening in the now and i i think you know it's it's something in our daily lives especially that we're you know as we're inundated with so many different bells and whistles and there's just always something in my pocket dinging you know, you kind of long for that that moment where it's like, you know, it was kind of nice when I was just sitting in a trench and trying not to get shot. That was yeah. a remarkably simple experience. <laughs> How do you today help to like keep life in that sense, like simple in terms of like living in the moment and being present with all these different notifications and distractions that can kind of come in because we make these to do lists that are, you know, number one priority and there's 50 of them. How do you kind of dial it down and really focus in on the things that are meaningful and impactful to you in your way of life? You know, it, it's, I think it gets harder every day, but it's remaining 100% focused on, on that mission. What is it, what is it that I'm doing and why am I, why am I doing that? And, and for me, it's something that has been constant really throughout my entire career, um, is making sure that I'm taking care of, 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 of service members, of, of the soldiers, uh, and a, a fellow veterans and making sure that, you know, everything I do is focused on, you know, supporting them. And that can take a lot of different paths sometimes. But at the end of the day, I can sit down and say, is, is this going to help me help a veteran? And the answer is no. Well, you know, I might do it eventually, but chances are it's going to lose priority pretty quickly. And, and then that's the exact question you ask yourself. Is this what I'm going to do to help me keep stay on, stay on course to make sure I'm serving yep. a veteran today? Yep. And I, and I think that's in any job, and that goes beyond the, the veteran space. You know, of course, the past um, what almost ten years, I've been in the nonprofit space supporting veterans. But even before that, um, you know, when I was looking at doing consulting work, you know, is this is the work I'm doing right now going to benefit my client, or is this just something else that somebody wants me to do? And if it's not going to benefit the client, then there's no reason for me to do it. And, and I think that as whether you're a, a, a military leader, a, a business leader, a, a manager. You know, these are questions that we have to ask ourselves to keep ourselves focused and keep our, you know, make sure that we're taking care of uh, our people, that they're, everything that they're doing is supporting, you know, that mission. And even in business, you still have a, a mission. You know, profit might be part of that mission, but it's at the end of the day, you know, you, you do have to kind of maintain that focus. But that that army and this was a, an army mentality, I think it's it probably transcends the services in different ways. But in the army, it was mission first people always. And if you take care of your people and you keep focused on the mission, then you're going to achieve better outcomes. Is there something specific that you do other, like, cause you get inundated with a lot of tasks, questions, things, you know, things to do, you know, like we have, when we're on a mission, we have like an X check. We're going through and calling off different pro words to making sure we're hitting different milestones. Mm-hmm. How do you kind of take a tactical pause through the day or when you start to kind of get overwhelmed to make sure you're asking yourself that question? Cause you, it's really easy to go from like, sun up to sun down and be like, where did the day go? Yeah. Well, and that's where, when you look at how the military trains you to be a thinker, how the military trains you to be a planner, uh, all of these things, the military decision-making process kind of embeds in you this whole notion of program management. And actually there's a bunch of different programs out there that 
really do just that. They, you know, you can spend months training to be a program manager, but when you go through those courses, you sit there and be like, wow, this sounds awfully familiar. Let me set measurable milestones. Let me look at what my long-term goal is and backwards plan off of that. You know, the one third, the, the ranger school, the one thirds, two thirds rule. You know, these are things that you take into your daily life and help you plan. And it's not, this isn't magic or any sort of advanced science. I mean, these are, you know, really basic things that you can be doing, but by setting those achievable and measurable milestones by breaking down big tasks into small tasks and understanding what can I delegate, what should I delegate, and where do I, more importantly, where do I have to be? Um, you know, another analogy I use is uh, the pickup line when I go get my kids from school. Uh, every day, you know, the principal comes out and he holds a stop sign right in front of the main entrance to the school. And I say, well, why is that? Why, 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 people are like, why do you notice that? I said, well, think about it. If you're the principal of the school, you're in charge of the school, where, where, during release time, where is the most important place for you to be? It's right in front of that school building where you can see the, you know, all the cars coming in, all the cars going out, the kids going this way, kids coming out the door, right? That principal, whether they think they've done it or not, has put themselves in that key position where everything else that's happening, because there's probably still a million things happening in the school, that principal has put him him or herself, in our case it's a him, in the position where they're able to see the most important things that are going on and to be able to make those kind of decisions on the fly, um, you know, to do those things. And the funny story was last week we had a uh, a bear came through our, uh, uh, right across the school property. Like an actual bear. An actual bear, yeah, yeah, Colorado living. Um, and so the principal's out there, and he's like, he gets on his radio, he's like, keep the kids in, in the school because there's a bear out here. And the kids stayed in school for an extra 10 minutes while some people went off and shooed the bear away. You know, was there a huge amount of danger? No, it was a black bear. They're skittish. It's not a big deal. But he was in that position to make that observation, make a quick change with the interest of keeping the kids safe. You know, and like I said, it's a small analogy, but these are things that when I look at it and look at my experience at the military, that was something that was always ingrained in me, right? If I'm in charge of a patrol, part of my decision-making process always has to be where do I need to be to have the greatest impact to make sure that our mission succeeds? Right. As a leader, like you put yourself at the greatest point of friction in order mm -hmm. to kind of make sure the mission can continue on and then everyone else kind of understands it's like the same time. Anytime you would leave, you would give, you know, a got one essentially where, where, you're, yep. where you're going, where you're going to go, when you're going to be back, what happens if you don't come back? And that provides expectation management for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And you as a leader also expect that in return because – uh, in, obviously in ranger school and other times like you're you're constantly leader not the leader you know depending on the mission and what's going on mm -hmm. you know and that's something you know like in you know both my wife and i were, were dual military as, as you are you know and one of the i think one of the greatest strengths of of, of learning military leadership you know is that communication the, the emphasis on how do you communicate intentions how do you communicate uh plans and and all these you know different tasks that need to be accomplished and that's something that if you look in the business world, um, you know, these are things that are tremendously important. You know, when I got out, I used my GI Bill to go back to business school. And some of the things that they were teaching in, in master's level business courses for leadership, you're sitting there and be like, well, of course, this is common sense. And then you'll sit there with your non-military peers and they'll be like, how did you, how did you know that? It's like, I mean, you just kind of pick it up along the way, I guess. Um, you know, but these are skills that everyone can bring into the workforce. And, and as veterans are in, entering the workforce, being able to communicate how those skills translate into, um, you know, into their into their next, into the, you know, their next scene, their, whatever their next act is going to be. And you didn't go to any business school, by the way. I just want to teach you real quick. <laughs> what, let's let's share with everybody where you went. Well, so it, and it's a funny story how I, I chose it. So when I was in when I was looking to use the GI Bill, I knew I wanted to go back to school. My wife and I had started a small business, and that was kind of the thing. After doing that, I said, you know what, maybe this business school is something to do. And I looked at a couple, and I went to some like veterans networking event, and I was living in Charlottesville, Virginia at the time. And I met with another veteran, and he said, well, why don't you apply to University of Virginia? And I said, man, that's like a really good school. Like, There's no way I'm going to get into that. And, he's, and he kind of looked at me, he's like, what do you get to lose? I said, you're right. And so I applied and got in, and, and it, I went to University of Virginia, which was a spectacular experience. Um, you know, and like I said, on the GI Bill, you know, so that was a, you know, a wonderful investment that the United States government made at me. And I work every day to make sure that I'm uh, returning that investment to, to the taxpayers. And that's probably another lesson, too, you've, you've taken away is like not self-selecting because there's 
when people say it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity, like I, I, I take, I'm, I'm hard on that because I think that there's so many opportunities. It's what you pick and decide because you're living with intention and you're communicating, you know, expectations. It helps you make those once in a lifetime opportunities. Like you said, like you, if that mm-hmm. maybe you wouldn't have applied it off, somebody wouldn't have said, what do you have to lose? Right. You know, and that's, and you would, one of the, the challenges that we see in the veterans community is this notion of, um, I used to have good words to describe it, but it really is like, it's, uh, you know, I, it's, I, I didn't do that. And, you know, so I, people will say, well, oh, Joe Reagan, he's an army ranger. I said, no, no, no. I went to ranger school. I'm not a ranger. And to me, that there's a meaning there. To most people, they're like, what's the difference? And, but then... You see it at all levels, right? And the number of veterans that I've met that said, well, I served, but I never served in combat. Or I, I served, but I was just a clerk. Or I served and I just did that. And to get out of that mentality as well to say, you know what? In the military, you have one choice. You get to choose to raise your right hand. And after that moment, promises can be made. But we all know that they're at the end, at the bottom line, that there is some fine print that everything that happens after you raise that right hand is at the discretion of the needs of the military. And whether you served uh, as a clerk, whether you got injured in basic training, the fact that you were willing to raise that right hand says something about your character, it says something about your work ethic, and it says something about your patriotism. And that's something that we should value and we should hold up and say, it doesn't matter what you did. Once you raise that right hand, it was out of your hands. And you know that's there's value that you bring to your post service career and it's up to all of us as as community members and, and in the nonprofit world folks like you and I as we share those stories we're helping to educate people about the value that veterans can bring to the to, to their communities whether it's in the nonprofit world whether it's as a volunteer whether it's in the business world all of these things you know veterans are bringing a skill set and most people don't necessarily understand what those skill sets are which makes it extremely difficult on a couple of different levels. You know, it, it is hard to translate those lessons that people, veterans are able to take away from their time in service because it's not always positive, right? Some, sometimes there, there's a lot of failure that leads to that, that positivity and mm-hmm. the goodness out of those lessons. Do you have a specific failure that was just absolutely just so fantastic it led to a great success in your life? I would say I would I would probably argue that every success that I've had in life was the result of many 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 failures right right how many people have seen that iceberg uh, cartoon circulating the internet right you see the peak you see that little bit of success at the top uh, yeah. but so much of that was working towards different things um, you know one specific event oh, you know I gotta say my 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 role in consulting did not I wouldn't say it was a failure but it definitely did not go as planned. And there were certainly projects that did not go well at all, you know, and to be able to maintain that learning mindset of, okay, this didn't go well, but this is some, again, you know, the military, the, the after action review. All right. This didn't go exactly how it's planned, but we, we did some things right. So let's focus on what we did right. And what do we have to improve upon and how are we going to make that pathway to make sure we don't make those mistakes again? And I think that that's something that's always stuck with me. And so that I'm, I'm not drawn to, to focus on those, those failures or those things, but really focus on the learning that comes from you know, each of those different moments. Um, and, and like I said, try my damnedest not to make the same mistake twice. It, that AAR is so critical too, because like it focuses on both sustains and improves. And mm-hmm. especially when it comes to the improves, it's like, all right, so we want to improve this or this needs to be improved. How do, what does improvement look like to make it a sustain? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't take, I mean, I've seen some of them go very long and some of them be very short, but it's really the action taken from the AAR, the after action review, that is the most impactful. Mm-hmm. And making sure it's measurable, right? We can talk about something and saying, oh, well, we have, you know, oh, let's, um, you know, let's make sure that we're doing better next, let's make sure we're shooting more accurately next time. Well, okay. Uh, what's that measurement what's that measurement going to look like how can we how can we turn that into something that just said let's do better to hey let's make sure that you know 90% of us are 
um, you know, shooting at the expert level or that 100% of us are able to shoot every weapon system in the, in the, uh, in the platoon. You know, and I look at stuff, you know, so now in my current role, you know, we do a lot of, of virtual and physical events. Um, and I use that same mentality. I, and I tell people at the beginning, listen, if you're planning an event, you're going to see every mistake that gets made because you plan the event. But know that no one else sees it. Everyone else is going to come out of it and be like, oh, that was the greatest event that we've ever done. Um, our, every, uh, the night before Reads Across America Day, we always host a, a big dinner in, in Washington, D.C., you know, last year we're, we're going through it and, you know, I was emceeing it and there was probably 20 things that went wrong over the course of the, the night. And I knew it. And the, the rest of the, the folks that were on the planning team knew it. And you just roll with it. And we said, you know, hey, listen, this is what we can do better. You know, hey, this thing went wrong because this person wasn't prepped or this person was across the stage and had to walk all the way over here. These are things that we can fix next time. But also let's walk away knowing that nobody else saw that as a mistake. And I think that when we're, we can be super critical, not in a negative sense, but in that learning mindset, that's where you see a lot of, of growth potential. And I think that, you know, uh, the veterans do approach life in just that sense. And that's, and I'll share another story with you. And when I was uh, prior to coming to Reeds, I, I did a, I worked for a nonprofit that did a lot with veterans homelessness. And we had a client that offered to, uh, when he was done with his, well, using us as a resource, um, wanted to take me out to coffee. And so we went and we grabbed coffee and he's sitting there and he's looking at the barista setup and he goes, do you know how to use any of that equipment? And I said, no, I've never worked in a coffee shop. He goes, I'll bet you I could learn how to use all that equipment in about a week. I said, yeah, I mean, it doesn't look like it's that complex. I mean, it would take me a while to probably memorize it and I'm a horrible server. So that's probably not the best career option for me. But yeah, I, we could probably learn how to do this. And he goes, you know the differences between you and I and most people? I said, what? He goes, once you and I learned how to use all that equipment, we would teach everyone else on staff how to use it too. And I said, yeah, of course we would. And he goes, you haven't spent enough time in the civilian world because in the civilian world, most people don't think that way. They pick up a skill and they say, well, this skill makes me valuable. And now I'm going to hold on to this piece of knowledge because that makes me indispensable. And in the military, we look at that and say, I have a piece of knowledge. And by sharing it with more people, that makes me indispensable. And I think that is, again, that growth mentality that's not just focused on the individual, but focused on the organization. How can I leverage the things that I learned to support the organization and grow others around me? And that's that, uh, you know, the tide rises all ships type all ships. mentality. Yeah. yeah. So and I think this is a beautiful point as we go into the, the final question, because you and I could chat all day, Joe. Um, because you know you're focused on the organization the growth around not only of yourself but other people mm -hmm. and you've talked about a lot of different things throughout on how you kind of stay intentional and manage expectations not only internally but externally joe reagan how are you better today than yesterday well um one i think uh having being a dad and having my kids constantly point out all those small flaws if you, if, you, if you have an ego, have children, and that will destroy your ego because they will point out every flaw. But as long as you maintain that, that mindset of what can I do just a little bit better today than I was yesterday, and that's going to be something different. You know, Some days it's a, hey, I slacked on my workout today, so I got to do better on my workout tomorrow. And some days it's a, you know, I really just did not do that interview well, and I didn't like it because I didn't talk about these things. Um, you know, in finding those ways of, of critiquing yourself in a way that's not negative, but with that learning and growth mindset is, is really important. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, you know, part of what makes me better today than I was yesterday is all the partners that we have at Reads Across America. You know, again, people think of Reads Across America as one day in December, um, but we've got over 3,500 partners of non other nonprofits that are across the country that are out there doing the important work to support um, our service members, veterans, and their families. And, um, you know, like I said, not only is that wreath the start of a journey between you and that person that, that you're laying the, the wreath on their headstone, um, but that's also supporting these organizations that are out there in the community. It's a, this is a program that's generated over $17 million to support nonprofits that are giving back to our community that are partnering in our mission to remember, honor, teach, and uh, getting to interact with those partners each and every day um, helps me 
be a better advocate for fellow veterans. Uh, it helps me understand the own issue, my own issues that I'm going through from time to time. And it helps me understand that the different resources that are out there in these communities and how we can better support them so that we can better support our veterans. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of resources, where can people go to learn more about Reese's Across America? Where are the best places to go? Where can they connect with you? Mm -hmm. So reasonacrossamerica.org is, of course, our website. We're on uh, Facebook, Twitter, all the LinkedIn, all the socials. Um, just search reasonacrossamerica.org, and that will come up to the, the website. You can learn more about our programs there, specifically um, our group and sponsorship uh, resource page. And then we also have a veterans resource page. Uh, which is located there as well. And that's where um, I kind of keep a running list of uh, all the different resources that I encounter. And uh, if you go on that page and you know a resource that you don't see, uh, there is a link there that will send an email directly to me and uh, be happy to learn about those resources and get up, up on our website. Awesome. And we'll make sure we look that in the show notes. And I'd be remiss to say if we didn't even, we got to highlight the radio station of Reeds Across America. That's right. You know, it is uh, Reeds Across America Radio, which the uh, Gutcher Six podcast is going to become part of our Reeds Across America Radio family, um, you know, is, is all about, you know, being a voice for our veterans and sharing those stories, um, you know, through segments like your own, your own podcast, um, the spouse angle that airs on Saturdays. Um, you know, I uh, co-host a, a show called Mission Matters to highlight some of those partnerships and talk about these experiences. And one of the first roles I had here at Reese Across America was, was spearheading the start of our, our roundtable series. So every quarter we have a roundtable discussion. Our next one is going to be uh, at the end of October, and I will get you that date because it's not on the top of my head right now. But uh, we'll make sure we link it in the show notes. Yeah, so you know, can always be access. But helping to destigmatize the issues that are impacting veterans by sharing stories, right? I can give you facts and figures all day long. But when we make it personal and we share the individual experiences of what our veterans have gone through and what they've sacrificed to, you know, on behalf of this country, that's what makes the connection. That's what helps people understand the personal aspect of our veteran experiences. And that, I think, is really important. And, and the one statistic I will throw at you is, you know, we're looking at it in, a, in our country today, less than 7% of Americans have ever worn our uniform. And, you know, that speaks uh, volumes to those men and women that have volunteered to serve. Um, but it also means that there are a lot of people out there that don't have that direct connection to our military, that have never made that experience, that don't understand what it's like to see their, their mother or their father or their sister or brother or their son or daughter off to do a deployment. Um, you know, so by using the radio station as a means to amplify those stories and help connect those stories with Americans um, is a huge part of our mission. So. And we're absolutely extremely honored and proud to be part of that mission going forward. Joe, thank you for sharing your methods, your strategies, your ideas, your lessons learned, and most importantly, thank you for having our six. I don't know what you've been told, Sixers, but the lawyers would like us to remind you that the views, opinions, and comments expressed on the Got Your Six podcast are solely those of the hosts or guests to include current and previous Department of Defense employees and should in no way be considered the opinions of or endorsements on behalf of the Department of Defense or any of its components, divisions, contractors, or other current and previous staff members.